Great to see you, uh, well, several of you that we have seen in the last few days um, at our different panels. Great to see you again and great to see also some uh, new faces and new names at our uh, Zoom screens. Um, we, have, we have come to the closing round table of this conference on migration and the future of work. Um, and um, I think we've had very interesting insights on different issues in the previous days, including on for instance, whether the point system is the right way to govern migration, but of course other issues like new forms of work, platform economy, essential, the, 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 the notorious by now discussion of who is an essential worker, what is essential work, and how migrants make their decisions. This panel actually brings um, in a way a new um, perspective in the conference as now we're gonna focus on global governance issues or uh, purely international migration uh, governance issues in a way coming, um, bringing our discussion into, into a full circle. And I'm very pleased to have a really distinguished panel here with me today. Um, Kathleen Newland, who is co a co-founder of the MPI and a senior fellow and has, I think she doesn't need much of an introduction. Is she has advised most international organizations and I remember first uh, coming across her work and, and, and Kathleen herself at the Global Forum on Migration and Development at the time when the global compacts were not even in the horizon, were not even, uh, you know, an idea in somebody's hand. Um, then Brenda Yeo, who is a professor at the National University of Singapore, and she also coordinates the cluster on migration in the Asia Research Institute. And Brenda too is very well known about her work on gender, migration and care with both a South, uh, Southeast Asian perspective, but also internationally. Jean-Christophe Dumont, those of you who were with us on the opening round table have already met him online. He's uh, the director of the International Migration Division in the OECD. Um, and I think he, he's got all the knowledge in terms of how are OECD countries in terms of migrations, what are the novelties in policies, what are um, the challenges, and we're very happy to have you with us. Uh, Jean-Christophe, and last but not least, my dear friend and colleague, Peter Scholten, who is a full professor at Erasmus University in Rotterdam, and also the coordinator of the MISCO network, a network of universities and research centers that work on migration that started out as a European now and is now as a European network and is now international, bringing together nearly 60 uh, universities. And Peter, wonderful to have you with us. Peter has um, worked a lot on cities and on second generations um, and a lot of work on comparative perspectives and on multi-level governance. So um, we have an ambitious um, and even optimistic question for today, which is, is our migration governance framework uh, future ready? So <laughs> what have we learned, I think, from our um, recent experience of the pandemic and how it has really turned upside down a lot of issues on migration? Um, and I'll start this discussion going straight to the, how can I say, to the meat of, of the question asking Kathleen about the Global Compact. Kathleen, it looks like the Global Compacts were voted, were negotiated fiercely, actually negotiated and even debated in a different world. Who would have imagined that migration and mobility would come to a standstill for totally different reasons. So, and I know you've written a very interesting report just uh, a couple of months ago about precisely what do we make of the global compacts uh, today in this current context? Are they still relevant? And are the institutional mechanisms foreseen in the compacts uh, still appropriate for governing migration as we leave the pandemic hopefully behind us? Yes, uh, it's great to be with you all. Thank you, Anna, for having me. And um, I, I think the answer to your question, you know, are the global compacts relevant fit for purpose is, um, forgive me for this equivocation, but the answer is both yes and no, uh, in the sense that what is in the global compacts, uh, the, and I'm going to talk mainly about the global compact uh, for safe, orderly, and regular migration, what's in there is highly relevant and there's certainly aspects of it that are more relevant than we even imagined at the time the compacts were being negotiated. Things like, um, you know, addressing and reducing vulnerabilities in migration, you know, with the number of migrants stranded, uh, kicked out of work, 
uh, deprived of wages and so on, that has become more relevant than ever. Um, using migration detention only as a last resort, as we've seen congregate settings become uh, the, the settings for rapid spread of the virus. Um, Enhancing consular protection is something that migrants stranded abroad have desperately needed and many have not had adequate access to, even in highly developed uh, people from highly developed countries. And probably the most important uh, element in this uh, context of the Global Compact, Objective 15, which calls for providing access to basic services for migrants, which includes, of course, uh, above all now, health services. And um, I think you know that aspect of the Global Compact is recognized not only as a protection for migrants, but as a protection for the whole uh, whole of societies um, because anyone's vulnerability becomes a vulnerability for everyone. Um, there, there are other aspects of the compact that I could mention, but those are the ones that <clears throat> come foremost to mind uh, when I'm saying, yes, the global compacts are still relevant <clears throat> and more than ever in some ways. But the, the no side of that answer is that we really don't have international instruments that address the problem of immobility. You know, the Global Compact addresses problems of mobility and many of the other uh, regional um, instruments and national instruments are addressed to how do we make it possible for people to, to uh, for the movement of people to occur with less friction and better outcomes. But we don't really have instruments that talk much about immobility and how to, how to restore mobility um, with all the uh, associated questions of access to livelihoods, um, and uh, international interdependence. When we see the number of countries, over 30 countries, just to give one example, over 30 countries depend on remittances for more than 10% of their GDP. So uh, a shutdown of migration without any um, frameworks really for restoring it, for sharing the burdens uh, has, has come to the fore as a problem in this pandemic. So let me leave you with those thoughts and um, look forward to the discussion to follow. I'm, I'm sorry, but I'm tempted to ask you a follow-up question. I was, um, okay, yeah. that was my personal um, view and impression that uh, unlike the Global Compact on Refugees that had the more streamlined institutional mechanism and framework um, organized around the UNHCR and the G GCM is very consultative in that sense, very participatory and this is good. But at the same time, it seems a bit clumsy and slow. And actually this pandemic has happened while the, the network, the UN network that would uh, offer the framework for the consultations was, was being set up. We haven't yet had the first consultations. They will happen at the end of 2022. Mm -hmm. so do you think uh, th this is a good thing? This is a bad thing because it, so it gave some, some opportunity for reflection an adjustment, but at the same time, as you say, there was no provision, for instance, for something new like immobility. How do you think, you know, should, should there be some change in this institutional mechanism? Well, I think um, the circumstances uh, dictate that we, we do need something more. We do need um, changed um, uh, mechanisms and, and institutional frameworks, but there, there is, uh, as, as you suggest, uh, the, the international community such as it is, is uh, sort of making this up as it goes along. And the uh, UN Migration Network has sort of by default uh, become the, the a mechanism that's sort of pushing a lot of these things forward. You know, it's helping uh, every region um, with the regional reviews of the global, of implementation of the Global Compact. Uh, certainly helping countries prepare for um, for the uh, the big reg um, uh, global review in 2022, and um, it wasn't really set up for that. You know, the migration network was set up independently 
of the global compact. It was a parallel process. And I know this because I designed it <laughs> in the secretary general's office and it was not part of the global compact. It was welcomed in the global compact, but it's become by default, the sort of implementation uh, czar for the global compact, although it doesn't have authority uh, apart from you know, intellectual and moral authority. So, so we're really making this up as, as we go along. Um, the other institution, which is of course closely associated with the network is IOM. Uh, because the network is housed at IOM, it's very sort of close to IOM. And um, I think, you know, that, that uh, a lot of countries are looking to IOM for help in this respect. Uh, IOM is, um, is constrained uh, in what it can do both politically and financially. But I think it is um, sort of trying to seize the moment <laughs> um, to um, when everyone is so aware uh, of how much um, how much progress is needed in in the governance of global migration. Hope that sort of begins to answer your question. No, that, that that's very interesting, and I, I yeah, I was not aware that the yeah the the UN network was was uh, also parallel process and independent. But I think um, yeah, as you said, the the open ended and dynamic character of the process probably in this case is is a good thing. And I want to turn now to, to Brenda, I mean, fo following up, uh, it seems like the pandemic has really broken down what used to be uh, our migration paradigm, our migration governance paradigm, regardless of whether that was a good paradigm, because many countries, um, as Kathleen was also saying, were relying on migration, including origin countries relying on immigration, uh, oftentimes temporary to um, specific destinations and to remittances. Um, I, I would like to ask you, Brenda, to reflect a little bit on those challenges of, of you know, the, this breaking down of mobility and what will happen next. Thank you, Anna. And um, I will, in a sense, uh, scale down from the global to the regional and focus mainly uh, in, in Asia. Uh, and um, I would like to, in a sense, reflect on transnational migration governance that's primarily based on temporary migration, because that's the major sort of um, mode of a migration that, that dominates uh, most of the major migration corridors. Um, this, this enforced transience of uh, migrants is a fundamental uh, governing principle in many uh, labor migration schemes in Asia. So prior to the pandemic, I mean, labor migrants were moving through temporary channels and that has been growing quite rapidly. Um, South and Southeast Asian men and women seeking overseas work in lowly paid sectors, such as construction work, care work, uh, domestic work. So an, um, a large part of low skilled temporary migration in Asia is brokered by, pri by private recruitment agencies. I mean, why is this so? Because by devolving responsibility for workers to the migration industry um, to, to channel and to facilitate the migration flows, uh, destination countries basically uh, can circumvent formal cooperation, I mean, um, bilateral arrangements, for example, with origin countries. So in that sense, um, the, that middle space is occupied by a migration industry that uh, takes over um, part of the governance of uh, migration flows. So in, in short, temporary labor migration regime is predicated on this brokerage facilitated low cost and continuous sort of transnational mobility, continuous churning across national borders. But uh, what is interesting is that COVID-19 has chiseled away at all these founding principles. Why? By rendering transnational border crossings more costly uncertain, subject to quarantines and virus tests, the pandemic compels this rethinking of the sustainability of temporary migration schemes in this long shadow of, of COVID-19. Um, so here I would like to be, I guess, a bit more optimistic than I usually am by looking for opportunities to seize the moment, as Kathleen puts it, and to think of what might spark change. So uh, what, what is interesting for me is that whilst the precarity of temporary migration for migrant workers has long attracted sort of policy concern and scholarly attention, but of course with very few solutions, this time the pandemic has also laid bare 
bear the unsustainability of the temporary migration regime for nation states in a period of stalled mobility. So this is an opportune moment to revisit a number of important but difficult issues that have not gained as much traction as they deserve in pre-COVID times. And I want to make three points. Uh, first is that um, in a post-COVID world where transnational mobility is more costly and subject to the vagaries of the virus, temporary migration schemes that offer visas and contracts of longer duration would probably have greater viability than the use and discard model that's, that's uh, predicated on this back and forth churning of migrant workers. So longer stays uh, without the ambiguity of arbitrary contract termination would obviate recurring brokerage fees for the individual migrants. It's very expensive to cross borders uh, and much of the cost basically is uh, uh, shunted down to migrant workers. So longer contracts will also be more conducive for skills acquisition and improve labor productivity. So my hope is that in the long run, I mean, um, given stock mobilities, uh, receiving societies might see the, the benefit of longer contracts and less churning. And from their point of view, it could also translate into a need for a smaller migrant workforce. And that might be an advantage from the point of view of the receiving societies. These longer contracts and more controversially, I mean, whether they should be coupled with selective residency pathways, that's an even harder nut, nut to crack, uh, will hopefully encourage sort of clearer employer responsibility and for home leave, for example, and repatriation. So in this fashion, my first optimistic point is that reduced mobility in the post-COVID times may mean less unproductive churning and more productive migrants. Um, a second point that I wanted to raise is that perhaps uh, reducing temporariness will also entail a re-evaluation of the place and value of migrant workers in receiving societies. I mean, um, so in, in Singapore, we saw that uh, segregating migrant workers in densely packed dormitories out of the citizens' sort of line of sight um, was something that was disastrous because it created sort of ideal conditions for virus spread, but also fomented sort of stigmatization and social exclusion. So instead of falling back on measures of separation and containment, uh, social re resilience could be enhanced by creating more op meaningful opportunities for migrant workers uh, in everyday social life, and um, importantly, regarding migrant labor as an integral part of the national labor supply. Because we did see a glimpse of this during pandemic times, incorporating migrant workers into national safety nets that provide virus testing, vaccines, and healthcare. Um, as they would to citizens. This has a positive effect, not just on migrant welfare, but could also be a means of future proving society and economy against the crippling effects of future pandemics and other global crises. And my third and last point um, um, is, I wanted to reflect a little bit about the debates about technological substitutes for low skilled migrant workers. I mean, this has been debated and uh, whether the conditions of low transnational mobility in the long aftermath of the pandemic may induce technological kind of progress in sectors that are traditionally dependent on temporary migrants to fill labor shortages. Um, and there's been quite a bit of discussion about uh, the use of robots, uh, AI, machine learning, engineering, and whether this will gain momentum and take over jobs in sectors such as logistics, uh, retail, hospitality, transport. However, I mean, um, whilst I, I haven't done, I think, enough research to, to come to a conclusion, it would seem that progress in certain sectors that are dominated by low-cost migrant labour, such as domestic work, uh, construction work that involves embodiment of work, um, progress, technological progress is likely to be much more uneven. Um, I've read of studies on Japanese elder care homes, for example, that found that robots displace rather than replace human labor. So um, it didn't sort of do away with migrant workers, just move them to uh, even lower end jobs. Um, and uh, so in that sense, technological innovations are likely to completely automate away the need for migrant workers in, in the care sector, um, the sort of uh, construction work perhaps and domestic work. 
Uh, in Singapore, I mean, uh, the government has made it clear that while Singapore will have to depend less on foreign workers, we are 30% dependent on foreign workers, uh, through automation, the country can never eliminate uh, its need for foreign workers. So, so in conclusion, I mean, um, I think what I wanted to try to, to, to anticipate is that in post-pandemic times, um, it's likely that um, the temp that there'll be a reduced volume of labor migration uh, in those times. Um, but it's unlikely that the temporary migration regime will come to a complete standstill. So on the supply side, I mean, uh, a, a survey done by some of my colleagues of migrant workers in Singapore uh, concluded that despite being at the epicenter of Singapore's coronavirus outbreak, the majority were planning to continue working in Singapore in a post-pandemic future rather than return home to even worse employment conditions and reduce access to medical care. On the demand side, despite the amplification of citizen first nationalisms and anti-immigrant sentiments across many countries, there's still no easy low cost substitute for migrants who are willing to take up the essential but 3D kind of jobs at low pay. So um, in that sense, I mean, um, in the next few years, I think um, it is high time that we move the temporary migration regime to a more sustainable and equitable basis uh, and um, my sort of um, optimism here is based on the fact that this will not only be uh, good for migrant workers who help to protect migrant lives and livelihoods, but um, from the point of view of uh, the politics of nation states, it will also help to safeguard the functioning of both sending and receiving economies with a stake in migration. So, I mean, probably over optimistic, but uh, I, will, I, will, I will end there, yeah. Well, thank you, Brenda. No, I mean, there's nothing wrong in being overly, optim overly optimistic. And I, I don't think, I, I think you gave us a very good um, kind of um, uh, critical insight about what are the dynamics right now. And as you said, both the supply and the demand side remain strong. And uh, it seems that, of course, we've had the temporary a temporary halt to mobility, but the, the socioeconomic and political dynamics behind international migration um, remain strong. And we heard that also yesterday, for instance, um, in one study that was presented about um, the, the design, um, prospective migrants to Canada. And as you said, the, the desire to, to come remains strong despite the uncertainties in relation to health and, and mobility, et cetera. And at the same time, as you said, different countries in different ways have realized uh, how much they are dependent on migrant labor. And, and I am also <laughs> cautiously optimistic that this invites also receiving societies into an exercise of humility uh, and of uh, you know, realizing how much we're interdependent. It's not that receiving countries are always you know, on the, having the upper hand. But I think uh, Jean Christophe is better placed to give us also a view from uh, you know, the governments and their policies. We had discussed at the opening round table briefly a little bit how Canada is uh, almost an exception to among OECD countries in going strong in terms of immigration targets for the coming years. But uh, the question I think um, uh, th that we're posing today is a bit broader is, uh, Jean-Christophe, how do you see the next five years unfolding if it were possible to have a crystal ball in terms of will we see different types of mobility like Brenda was suggesting in the sense of a reinforcement of more long-term migration rather, rather than temporary schemes or circular schemes? Um, should we expect to see that some international migration will be replaced by the so-called virtual mobility where people will be working from different places or should we see more of the same you know, with some improvements? Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for the opportunity to share some, some thoughts. Uh, Anna, your questions, <laughs> uh, million dollar questions, each, each of them. Uh, and so I, I don't have a pretension of, uh, of uh, offering uh, uh, really uh, informed answers, but uh, just, just, a few, uh, just a few thoughts. 
Um, I'll start with you know that quote from the UN Secretary General uh, in in July saying that uh, the pandemic is like an X-ray revealing fracture in the fragile skeleton of our societies, and I think as uh, Kathleen and uh, and Brenda said, uh, I think I think this is uh, absolutely true. I believe it's also acting almost like an accelerator of of change change which were already there um, and, and some of which have been pushed uh, uh, or at least now we think they, they will be pushed by, by the pandemic. And let me just highlight uh, briefly three or four points here. So the, the first one is uh, uh, following up on, on what Brenda just said and, and also your question, uh, Anna, I think is, is around uh, um, technological change. Uh, automation, we, uh, we mentioned it's, it's everywhere in, in, in the debate. Uh, I think this was uh, uh, already well advanced. It will continue, uh, will probably get further push uh, with, the, um, with the pandemic. But uh, here, the effect on migration is, uh, is very unclear and actually may even be paradoxical. Uh, as uh, we see in, in OECD countries, uh, that uh, the share of recruitment of uh, foreign workers among uh, occupations which are growing is actually higher than the share in the general population, not so surprising, but, but lower than the share of immigrants in occupation which are declining. So these occupation which are declining because they are going through structural changes, uh, they still need to recruit. But obviously resident workers, be they migrants or not, don't want to take these jobs because they know there is no future. And so it's other, uh, despite less people being recruited, uh, recruitment difficulties uh, continue. And so in this transition period, which will you know, take some time, um, actually uh, can't we might need more immigrants uh, rather than less and and we're talking about some of these low-skill occupation with some of the effects that Brenda was was talking about but but beyond autom automation there are issues uh, in terms of um, issues in terms of uh, digitalization and here uh, this is probably the area where uh, this pandemic uh, is having the most uh, most impact so um, very very I mean, Three, three broad thoughts here. Uh, one is about this dis disconnection between the place of residence and the place of work. So uh, most of us are teleworking. I can see that from the videos here. Uh, and, uh, and obviously you can do that from, from your home and your home can be, can be in a different place than, than your country of, of work. Uh, but it can also be you know, a third place. So you can be born in country A, work in country B and, and live in country C because country C has, uh, I don't know, better weather condition, uh, low uh, living cost, etc. I think we, we're going to see more and more of that. And actually that's going to be a challenge for migration policies because most countries, they are not necessarily equipped uh, with, with this particular status of, of resident non-worker uh, uh, migrants. Um, second thing is uh, uh, a lot of countries uh, went online for a number of things. Uh, it, it goes from the asylum application uh, uh, to, to the uh, application for, for visas uh, and so on and so forth. Um, and and uh, clearly here, uh, if, you, if you think longer term, uh, uh, countries uh, or potential migrants may have through this online application system uh, you know, better chance to compare what the countries offer. Uh, now it's very difficult. Uh, only a few countries are online. The point-based system, you can, you can test yourself in a few countries. But imagine a world where you could just go on, online on, on a software, on an application, and then just pick the country that gives you the highest chance because everything is online. Everything is transparent. Everything can, can be uh, uh, self-assess uh, fa fairly easily. I'm not saying we are there and we, we're going to get there uh, um, um, brief, uh, shortly, but, but it, it, you know, it just might be another push towards this uh, fundamental uh, principle for uh, highly skilled migration in particular, where country, uh, people are choosing the country, not countries are choosing the people. Uh, and, and, and so you can, you can see more of that uh, uh, going forward. 
Um, there, there are a number of uh, issues around digitalization and integration and, and many other aspects, obviously. The second point is about ima emerging new destination. There was some talk about Asia, obviously, um, they, you know, the pandemic is also happening at a time when the US is reconsidering its migration policy. The UK is exiting the EU uh, with, uh, you know, the, the need to find uh, migrants elsewhere. Uh, so, so it's not only about COVID, uh, but, but the COVID is, is pushing things in, in different direction. Asia, for sure, Asia has uh, went through the, the, the pandemic so far actually much more smoothly than uh, European countries at least. Uh, and, and so it, it will probably have an impact on their capacity to attract students, international students uh, and, and workers uh, in different ways going forward. But the other very important change is actually uh, not, again, not related to, to, to the COVID, but accelerated by COVID. And, and uh, you may you know, think this is entirely disconnected, but I don't think it is. It's the, the decline in the uh, price of oil. Um, as we're moving to, uh, to, to you know, success, hopefully on climate change, I mean, the, the, the price of oil is going down. And when you look at the, the main uh, you know, recruitment countries or countries, big countries of origin, uh, uh, there is certainly a big connection there. And I, and I, and I think that uh, indirectly, the change in terms of, of uh, origin destination on migration will, will change, uh, including be because of that. I, I'm not sure the GCC model is, is sustainable. Uh, I, I'm not sure some countries which have been able to maintain their population because of uh, access to uh, the, the financing from oil uh, will, will be able to do so in the future. So you, you may have both difference in, in, in terms of pull and push factors on, on migration as a result of that. The third element uh, uh, is, is obvious, it's health. Uh, so certainly we, we're all discussing now in every forum uh, possibility for a passport vaccine or other ways to facilitate mobility in, in, in the COVID context. Uh, uh, not sure whether this uh, will lead to any agreement before we, we get out of a crisis, but what, what is sure is, is that the health dimension in, in terms of, uh, of the condition for moving around will change. And I, I would say that also health will um, be looked at differently in, in the selection. Uh, so, you know, I, I think that uh, potential migrants, notably highly skilled work choice, as I said before, We'll start looking at, you know, in, in what condition can I access to healthcare, what is the quality of healthcare, etc. That will become part of our decision making. But also, um, uh, but also some destination country may start uh, screening people not only according to their education, but also to their health uh, capital. Uh, and you see already some countries doing that. Uh, uh, and, and you know, when you look at uh, the policy decision in Australia, it often pioneer uh, policy changes in other country. And, and certainly this is, uh, this is already a direction that, that Australia is taking in different ways. Um, and well, my, my very last point uh, is, uh, is that certainly the pandemic is affecting the public debate on migration. Um, again, this is not new, uh, but, um, you can see in, in Europe in particular, uh, um, it, it brings back the, the question of border at the center of the public debate. Uh, yes, in some other areas, uh, it has uh, uh, brought the issue of essential workers and the extent to which uh, we may be dependent uh, on, on migrant workers to perform some, uh, some activities, uh, be they high skill or, or lower skill in agriculture or, or uh, um, uh, in, in the agricultural sector more generally. Um, it's, it's hard to know how this will evolve, how this will unfold. Uh, but uh, if you, if you I, and I think it, it might uh, have different impact uh, in different countries, so it, it will probably not be uniform. But certainly when you look at the European debate, uh, it's not very promising. Uh, you can see uh, that it was already difficult before. Uh, the capacity of the EU to reform its uh, migration asylum system, to start with that. 
uh, is, I think, lower than what it was uh, a few years back. And, and so it's, it's a big challenge. Uh, and and uh, I, yeah, I, it's hard to, to know in which direction it will, it, whether we should be uh, uh, optimistic or pessimistic, but uh, I think that also be a, a key to the policy changes uh, we should contemplate in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jean-Christophe. Uh, well, I think you, <laughs> you offered in, in Italian, we say uh, it will be for Peter to togliere le castagne dal fuoco, you know, get the chest out of, of uh, the, the fire in terms of what happens in Europe. But I think it is very important what you said and the distinction between automation and technological innovation and how this affects uh, work and labor markets and in relation to migration, what are the short-term and long-term impacts um, and the question of digitalization. I think this is a very important distinction and how digitalization is affecting, again, work in general and, and migration um, in particular. And I think I'm, I'm sure many of us in this virtual room have a few anecdotes to say about this disconnect between the place of work and the place of residence, not just that we are working from home, but that sometimes people chose to work from, uh, you know, a different, sometimes their country of origin to which they hadn't lived for a while, um, or a third place. And then this is, yes, another interesting aspect. But I'll, I'll turn to Peter, who, who will have, yeah, the difficult job to tell us a little bit more about what is happening in, in the European Union my personal view is that in a way the European Union has come out stronger from this uh, pandemic crisis because there's been a lot of sense of solidarity and cooperation. Of course, borders have been um, a hot issue at, at some points they were closed, but on this we need to say that borders between provinces in Canada, that is a federal state, have been closed. In Australia it has been the same. We've seen closures of such borders, so the, the, the partial opening and closing of borders among the member states is, is, not, is nothing, I think, to, to surprise us. But what I, I think I have a question to you, Peter, like the general overview, but also more specifically, um, the European Union has gone ahead to publish its EU Pact on Migration and Asylum in September 2020. And it seemed to me that it was like it was happening in a vacuum. So the pandemic wasn't there. Obviously, the pact had been in the making and in discussions for a long time, but it almost seemed that it was happening in a, in a vacuum or kind of bracketing out uh, the pandemic as something that would come and go, as of course we all hoped for. So we would like to hear your insights. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Anna, for, for the question. And uh, congratulations also on this wonderfully organized uh, conference uh, to you and, and Shintu. And uh, also thanks to Jean-Christophe for the nice bridge, as we would call it, uh, between uh, your and my uh, talk, on, uh, which focused on, on Europe. Uh, I think, Anna, you're, you're raising a very fair question. Um, I'm not sure whether on the first point I would be equally positive uh, that Europe is coming out quite uh, strong, especially when looking at the second point, our European Pact on Migration and Asylum. It very much reflects the struggle that the EU is going through, um, uh, trying to revise or rethink a system, um, but not being entirely able to do so, not having many options to choose from also, and also suffering, suffering of course, from clear internal political contestation around uh, around the issue. So I have to say that I'm, I'm rather critical of the extent to which the EU has actually managed to reinvent itself. So we have a new pact, but what is really uh, new about it? So if you look at that pact, then this typical European security frame has remained very dominant in this, uh, in this, this pact. So we don't see a shift towards more, academ uh, more economic framing of, of migration whatsoever. And so the focus is on border control, uh, EU external border control. It's on fast screening at borders. It's, if you look very clear, very closely, then pretty much, um, uh, well, the vast majority of Dublin Tree, if I put it modestly, the vast majority of Dublin Tree is still very much there. So uh, there is not really a reinvention. 
also when it comes to collaboration with sending countries, with, with partner countries across, across the Mediterranean, for instance, which could, which could have been a very promising innovation. If you look at the partnerships that are being shaped between the EU and third countries, um, they are very much security driven. So uh, trying to prevent migration to Europe and trying to encourage return migration from Europe to those, to those countries. And in the context of this, this conference, a, com a connection with labor migration is hardly being made. It's a typical European thing to really separate labor migration and other forms of migration. I'll come back to that, that later. Another one is, of course, the distribution of responsibilities within the EU. And we now have this new flexible solidarity system, but also that is very much security driven. Other countries take in uh, migrants or they assist in the return of, uh, of migrants. So, so that is flexible solidarity. This has nothing to do with the huge um, differences within in Europe, within Europe, between countries, but also sometimes we, we should also not only look at countries, sometimes the differences are for regions or for cities. Think about Italy, uh, the difference between Milan and the south of, of Italy is huge, of course. But the differentiation within Europe in terms of either demand for migration or the lack of demand. So there are clear zones in Europe, in, in, in indeed have a clear economic demand for migration for multiple reasons, but there are also clear areas who resist that. And that's, that's, you know, that, that's really complication in EU, EU politics. Uh, some countries uh, are powerful in that regard, Hungary, Slovakia, but also Poland. And Poland is of course a major force in, in Europe. Uh, and what has come on top of that, so uh, Anna, you describe it as a vacuum. Um, I'm not sure whether a vacuum is the, the right term. I think this pandemic frame has reinforced the security frame because it added a health argument to the already existing security arguments in, in place. So it now also gives this false illusion that preventing migration, restricting migration, good also for health security reasons, and it prevents the, it creates the illusion that we're also very effective in trying to control migration, that we live in a sort of a, 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 well, a world with far less migration than, than in the past. There I'm also less, or less inclined to immediately see the huge differences before and after the pandemic in terms of migration. If there's one eternal law in migration studies, then it's that where there are inequalities, you'll see migration. And due to the pandemic in the immediate surroundings of, of Europe, inequalities have deepened uh, radically even. So I wouldn't go too fast in the direction where I would say that new technologies would lead to less migration or different forms of, I think the inequalities will lead to, um, to different forms of migration, yes, but probably more to irregular forms of migration, uh, for instance. So why am I so critical of the EU regime? Well, I think there are three points where I'm very critical of, well, not the regime in general, but critical of the EU pact on uh, migration and asylum. First point is um, I'm critical because of what is not in there. Eh? So it's, it is not a pact on migration and asylum. It's a pact on asylum with some other part to it. Yeah, so what it doesn't say is, is very, very important. Uh, there is not a clear roadmap in Europe on how to promote more legal, more routes for legal migration. And labor migration is very much separated out of this pact. EU blue card system is very much alive. And uh, I think that irregular migration is now the, the vast, the largest route into the Europe, into the EU when it comes to, to well, making your way onto Europe's labor uh, uh, markets. Integration also hardly is part of it. The EU has launched a new integration part to the pact on migration and asylum, but it's very limited. And so this, this comes together. It's the other side of the coin of, well, believing security myth and this control myth and this, this myth of having less migration means that the EU will do less in terms of integration. I think that's a very dangerous gamble uh, for, for the EU. Um, yeah, and one drivers behind that, I haven't heard it be yet in the, in, the, in the talk so far, but is of course that the EU counts on intra-European mobility 
in order to fulfill labor migration demands within the EU. So the EU doesn't really see a need that much for extra, so for outside of the EU uh, labor migration to Europe. It really counts on intra-EU mobility. And that form of mobility cannot legally be framed as migration according to the EU, because they are just EU citizens making use of their rights for free movement within the EU for labor, for labor reasons. Uh, but, uh, so this, uh, this comes on top of, of, of the mid. Um, Another, another myth, uh, this is my second point, is the strong belief in the control myth. So the EU believes that you can really control migration. We don't build walls yet, but well, Hungary came pretty close to building a wall, uh, I think, or closer than I would have thought that the EU would ever come, uh, uh, having the history that we have in, in Europe. Um, but I still very much believe that by tight regulations, you can actually limit migration, asylum migration and labor migration. And hence also the investments in border control rather than the investments in, in uh, legal routes uh, for, uh, for migration. That's also why in the new sector, I don't see a lot of improvement in terms of the implementation of policies. A lot of things go wrong in terms of implementation. If you look at Moria, the, the camp, which is a disgrace to the European Union, which has uh, human value is very high in its uh, in its European Union. Um, the reason why Moria could, could be there is not because of our policies on paper, it's because of our very poor implementation regime. And I don't see a lot of extra efforts in, 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 uh, in that area. Um, so uh, yeah, Dublin largely um, uh, remains and Dublin didn't work. So I don't anticipate the new pact on migration and asylum to work uh, very well. So once again here, I think that we will see a rise of irregular uh, migration. My third point, why uh, I'm so critical, is that there's a lack of this broader structural perspective on migration. So Europe sees migration still as something that can be controlled, but also isolated very so, so the broader connection with the inequalities of COVID-19 uh, are hardly being made. So this view that COVID may in fact lead to more migration to Europe rather than less. I mean, I don't have a glass ball, so I don't know, but I think the EU is just counting too much on that they will be able to control that uh, migration. So there's no connection there with broader inequalities. There's hardly any connection with climate migration, um, which is a key driver at Europe's immediate surroundings. The Syrian war was a war also driven by climate change. So a broader connection between migration policies and the root causes such as climate change, it's, it's very, uh, very, very, very soft uh, in, in the policy. It's sometimes there in words, but it's not there in terms of funding. And especially when it comes to the connection with uh, the, the need for some European sectors for economic migration, that connection is hardly being made. And on purpose, I have the feeling, as the EU blue card system, labor, labor migration regime is isolated as much as possible from the migration and asylum pact so that the EU can also you know, um, uh, advertise something that is rather tough in terms of the control uh, myth. So it's really the question, one of the key questions for today was, is Europe now prepared for the future of migration? Well, I'm rather critical of that. I think Europe is still very much occupied with responding to what happened in the last decade, rather than really preparing itself for what will happen in, in, the, in the next uh, decade. Uh, and just to, 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 to take out one of the concrete examples, these international partnerships on paper they can be incredibly promising. And in the pact, finally, we have international partnerships. But if you look at the details, they're all security driven, forcing countries to take back return migrants, forcing countries to prevent further migration to the EU, but not helping them with, uh, with, with mitigating climate consequences, for instance, or helping them with economic development. Um, so that there are more economic opportunities uh, there, helping them to address root causes of migration to, to the EU. Um, perhaps opening selectively labor migration routes into the EU, uh, which as a sort of a waterbed effect may also mitigate other forms of migration towards the EU. So this more open 
um, a foresightful approach towards uh, migration. I think that I think that is still rather missing in the EU. Um, as a political scientist, I, I understand where that is coming from. Huh? We shouldn't isolate, we shouldn't pretend as if the EU is just designing these policies based on only expert advice. I know where it's coming from, but I think that then still we as experts you know, also have our role to, 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 to study this, to analyze, to raise our critical, critical voice, to, um, to address the extent to which I would expect this to lead to a more effective migration regime. And there, to conclude, uh, my talk, I, I would be rather critical. Yes, it's a good, it, it's a response to the political circumstances in the EU. No, it doesn't prepare us for the next decades. Okay, that was <laughs> that was quite a blunder, uh, Peter, on on uh, yeah the EU um, pact and generally on the outlook. I very much agree with you. This is a very important point on the um, fragmentation or segmentation. Um, in the way in which migration and asylum are, are um, thought of and, and discussed and planned ahead in relation to the policy, as you said, as if it were possible to compartmentalize and say, yeah, here comes uh, the highly skilled migration, here come the asylum seekers, here comes low skill migration or irregular migration, when we know that in reality, these are very much interconnected processes and also the motivations can be very mixed. It's very difficult to distinguish those on the ground. And uh, yeah, I, I unfortunately um, agree with you that there is so much emphasis on control. Of course, my comment or question, which is probably um, not just for the EU is, is the relationship between policies and, and politics and the way in which this can fit into each other. Because unfortunately it's probable that the, if there could be a, you know, a public opinion survey, I'm not sure that the Eurobarometer has run such a survey recently, um, a majority of European public, not necessarily with the relevant information, because that, that's another question, how are people informed, what do they know? Um, and we heard about this in, in one of the presentations about the, the UK point system being presented as in Australia. Um, as, as a system with Australian toughness and uh, how much there was this, there was this confusion between tough Australian asylum policy and proactive as Australian labor migration policy. But the way it was presented in the UK is Australians are tough, our point system is tough, it's Australian type. So anyhow, they, they, this, this whole, uh, confu I mean, th this whole circle, vicious or virtues between the politics and the policies. Um, and I think that, that that is something perhaps that stays with us. Um, I, I'd like, I mean, because I see there's already questions from the chat and uh, we've taken quite a bit of time with your very, uh, very rich and interesting introductions to come back uh, to Kathleen. We have a question for you, Kathleen, on whether you think the pandemic is pushing the network uh, to find a common voice or whether perhaps it has centrifugal, uh, um, you know, impact uh, on on the consultations. Whether it has what kind of impact, Anna? I'm sorry, I didn't quite hear you. Whether it is pushing the network to, to speak more in with one voice, or whether it pushes the network to go different directions, because obviously different countries have different um, challenges, as also Brenda was suggesting. Yeah, I think, uh, it, thank you for the question. It's a, it's a really interesting one. I think the, the network and its whole sort of rationale <clears throat> is to allow the UN to speak, the UN agencies to speak with one voice. And it's been reasonably uh, successful in that, uh, not 100%, you still have, you know, differences, uh, different stances on the part of an agency um, like UNHCR versus the others on protection questions where UNHCR takes a more uh, sort of doctrinaire position um, and others may take a more practical position. Um, but, uh, but that's changing, uh, I think, a bit and, and perhaps under the influence of, of the network. I, I think the other, um, sort of salutary effect of the network is that it does have a mechanism for bringing in uh, non-state voices in, in the working groups, um, which allow 
uh, civil society organizations, academics, um, and, and others to participate in these discussions. And, um, you know, I think, uh, I think that has, you know, one might expect that to have uh, the effect of sort of diffusing the voice, but that, that hasn't been my observation, partly because the working groups are quite targeted on specific practical questions. So um, thus far, I think uh, the, the network has, um, has, has been a, a voice, uh, a unifying voice, uh, at least for the UN system. Um, not necessarily for all the member states, but that's not what it's for. It's really uh, a mechanism to allow the UN to uh, consolidate what it has to offer to states and uh, offer it in a coherent way. So, you know, I think it's, um, it's, it's, it's doing that. I mean, within the tremendous limitations of uh, funding and bureaucracy and, um, and so on. Yeah, and I think, well, um, I think we should add that perhaps we should give the network a chance, at least until the end of 2022, and see how things evolve and how the network, um, you know, stands up to, to the challenge. It's true that now it's also easy for us to criticize and speculate because it's all in the very early stages and after such uh, landslide, uh, de landslide development. And, and coming to the landslide development, I think Jean Christophe, there's a, a lot of interest in your ideas about. Uh, uh, you know, the, the, the disconnect uh, between the place of work and the place of residence. Um, and uh, we have a couple of questions, whether you see this having an effect on receiving countries and their, um, how can I say, anxiety to retain uh, the workers that they want. And uh, you mentioned something about Australia, but I wasn't sure in, in that sense, what is it that Australia is, is doing that is innovative or forward looking because uh, my, my impression of what is happening right now in, in Australia is that um, given to public health the absolute priority, the Australian government has not hesitated in creating um, immobility, probably a big gap in the labor market and a big financial hole, for instance, in universities, as it turns out to be that Australian universities are among, were among those most exposed to international students where we were even having this paradoxical uh, situation where actually the international students were indirectly paying for the domestic students. Because once these were not going to Australia, there was a big uh, gap in the public finances. So perhaps you'd like to elaborate more on this disconnect and on the Australian uh, you know, innovation. So yes, uh, on, on, on this disconnect, I, I think, again, uh, this is certainly not for all migrants. This is uh, probably only for, for those who can choose and uh, who can telework. And uh, they, they probably uh, are a minority uh, in, in the migration movements globally, but uh, they have been the focus of the migration policies uh, across OECD country in the recent years. I mean, uh, we mentioned the EU, and if, this is, if there is one area where the EU may actually make progress uh, 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 fairly shortly is on the EU blue card, the reform of, of the EU blue card, and uh, uh, much more difficult uh, with much more difficulty on other aspects of uh, of uh, asylum and, and legal migration. So, so this is really for this. Uh, not niche, but very small part of, of, of a migration, even if a share of tertiary educated among migrants have been increasing uh, uh, throughout uh, the past decades, uh, reaching about 30% uh, nowadays. But, um, but that would be, a, a, you know, it's a change in, in, in the, uh, the way countries uh, attract people because they, they attract talent, but they also may want to attract uh, you know, taxpayer or people are gonna spend a lot of their money in their place of residence. You you see already some countries like Estonia going with e-residence permits. Uh, you have uh, you know weak signals of that happening, and obviously uh, for Canadians uh, spending half of their year in the Caribbean is is kind of a normal practice when you can afford it. Uh, so. <laughs> 
you know, it's it's there are signs of that. I'm I'm I, I just thinking that we may see more, and uh, and certainly countries from from a legislative perspective are not necessarily well equipped uh, uh, with that. But um, it's, it's it's just one one of these emerging trends. Uh, regarding Australia, my comment was very specifically on health. Uh, Australia's Australian migration policy is probably the one which already takes the most into account health issues. Uh, you can be rejected based on your uh, 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 on your health uh, condition. Uh, Australia is looking at the long-term fiscal impact of migration uh, in making uh, collective and individual decisions. Uh, it's the only country which prevents people uh, above a certain age threshold, I think it's 45, to, to, to come. Uh, and, uh, and, and Australia is uh, already well advanced in thinking uh, how they can reopen safely borders uh, and, and what, what is in the pipeline as far as I, I know is, is basically to um, impose on people that they would have to share some uh, personal information about uh, their health status. Uh, and, and I I think that that might become common practice uh, going forward, uh, that people will have to be able to, to share this information if they want to, to travel. Uh, so it, it will go beyond probably the, uh, the vaccine passport and, and, and things like this, uh, uh, showing uh, through hubs that uh, you haven't had any fever in the, I don't know, in the past uh, uh, four weeks or things like this. Uh, but but you may even see, you know, uh, um, if you push this idea a, lit, uh, a little bit further, what, what is doing the point system is basically uh, uh, to trying to assess the, uh, the set of factors that uh, uh, correspond to the highest probability of successful integration long term. Uh, well, you could add the health dimension to this point system. And, and, and basically trying to screen people who are gonna uh, uh, bring the less burden on your health system. Uh, so I, I think this is a uh, very early stage, but uh, I would not be surprised if health issue in general takes more space in the migration policy design going forward. And I think Australia is a little bit ahead of everyone else. Anna, could I, could I, um, I was asking you on the chat, to do, yeah, because I, I was saying, yeah, go ahead. A comment uh, just on, on um, uh, Jean Christophe's first point, which I think raises some really interesting questions about, you know, looking forward, who are the mobile workers? You know, we, we think of the highly skilled people as being the internationally mobile workers, but if they're able to work from wherever they are, uh, for the most part, and it's the lower skilled, who have to do the jobs that must be done on site and in person, it completely sort of upends the, the hierarchy of mobility among, among migrant um, uh, labor migrants. And I think that has, I don't think countries have really begun to think about that very much. The related question that I'm pretty sure they haven't started thinking about is how, are, how do they protect their labor markets when you have people working remotely who don't need a visa. Um, you know, I've seen this in my own institute. We have interns uh, who come for the summer who normally they have to have a visa. But now we have interns in Europe, we have interns in Latin America, we have interns in Canada, as well as the US, and they don't need a visa, they're working remotely. Um, governments feel that they have an obligation to protect their labor markets, but how, how are they going to do this, particularly at the high end, when uh, people can work from anywhere? Or a lot of people can. <laughs> oh, well, yeah, of course, um, I can tell you that, that for instance, um, in, in, at Ryerson, in, in our program, we had several international um, colleagues joining us, some of whom are, have joined us really literally in the last month or two after a long wait for immigration because you cannot have a contract and you cannot pay properly someone if they don't have a work permit in Canada. 
And to get the work permit, they have to physically enter the country. And I had even myself proposed back in the summer, uh, this idea of a digital work permit that would be a temporary solution for such people like you mentioned, Kathleen. And I think this, is, this has been a true challenge in many cases where people could start working and paying taxes at the future destination countries while they wait for borders to reopen, you know, these health issues to be, um, to, to be fully ironed out. But that, of course, in, in answering the, the question of uh, Jean-Christophe uh, or also of Brenda is, yeah, it maintains the idea that there is a tight connection between the, the, the migrant, the worker and the taxpayer where, who are territorial and not deterritorialized. But of course, as we know, I mean, first there are cases like students or interns where of course there's, there's more flexibility or cases where lawyers can come up with very clever solutions for, for this kind of um, uh, telework. And so, so I do think, yeah, this, in this, the pandemic has uh, pushed us a few years past forward, uh, like uh, compared to where we were. But, but on this, I'd like to come back also to another question from the chat, which uh, was mostly for Brenda, but probably is, is relevant for all is, what is the role of intermediates and in particular for temporary migration? As you were saying, Brenda, there's a whole industry that is fed by, well, the brokers most importantly, but a lot of um, related institutions that are fed by this uh, constant coming and going of people. So do you see this as changing and who would, kind of, would this help the origin or the destination countries take a different role? Yeah, um, thanks for the question. And um, just to reflect the, on the earlier point that Kathleen was making, um, in that sense, um, working remotely is really a, a privileged position only for privileged migrants. I mean, uh, low end sorts of, uh, workers who are, who are paid for their embodied labor basically don't have the privilege of um, working remotely. Yeah, so and, and, and that's tied to the question of brokers because uh, the brokers that I speak about are basically move uh, low skilled workers. They facilitate migration and profit from the constant churning of migrants back and forth across the border. So of course, brokerage activity did come to a halt when the borders were closed completely. But in the aftermath of the, the peak of the pandemic and as borders sort of begin to open selectively and, and it opens and shuts, you know, it's very uneven. And there are even more rules than ever. My sense is that in this in this uh, very uneven migration regime, we're going to see even more opportunities for brokers to take advantage of the, the infrastructural gaps, the holes basically, and to make profit by facilitating migrants. Uh, and here I'm talking about low skilled migrants um, uh, across borders, because as the rules become more complicated, as we know, the migration industry then in a sense has a bigger role um, as the state sort of regulates by, by putting up more rules. Um, you need these uh, migrant bro brokers to step in to facilitate uh, the documentation and so forth, the health checks and all that to, to move um, migrant workers. So in short, I, I am pessimistic about um, governments taking over the regulatory space and, um, and, and sort of uh, taking over the role of, of migrant brokers in the case of low 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 skilled uh, migrants and uh, even if they did I'm not sure that uh, it will actually benefit migrants I mean um, um, and um, the Korean uh, employment permit system which is an attempt by the government to in a sense cut out uh, migrant brokers is a, a, a good case study uh, and there are of course pros and cons so so I, I guess I, I will place my hopes on a more limited space, uh, what I was talking about of, of longer stays and less churning of migrants. Um, because as I mentioned, if, if that is done, then it cuts brokerage fees and helps to increase sort of skills acquisition and investment in human capital of the migrants. Um, so, so in a sense, uh, that would be what I can see as 
a possible move forward, but to, in a sense, obviate the role of migrant brokers, I actually don't, I'm, I'm not very, very sort of um, optimistic about that, yeah. Uh, th these are very interesting comments, Brenda, and actually this brings me to, to a question that I had myself to uh, actually all of you. So um, again, trying to think, uh, think a little bit uh, innovatively, um, and Peter, with all the, the, the yields of um, the EU, the EU is also a regional migration system, what we would call an enhanced mobility regime within the EU, which in the case of the EU, it is addressed by a citizenship that has existed now for over 30 years, and which gives full socioeconomic uh, rights and limited political rights to people moving to, to another uh, country. There is something similar in the Mercosur, uh, where people um, can also circulate freely. There's no citizenship in, uh, attached to it, but there is a tradition, I mean, it comes from, um, how can I say, a commitment and a feeling that the, that the region is, is culturally and historically and politically uh, interrelated. And we know that there are similar, but I would say less developed so far, schemes in ASEAN, in Southeast Asia, and in ECOWAS in West Africa. So would it be, would this be a way to go as in, in a way in doing away with quite a lot of the bureaucracy on one hand. And also I wonder whether, for instance, hearing about all the health uh, uh, requirements that will play a role in the coming years, whether countries would prefer this regional kind of clustering and regulating this within regions. I don't know, I'll, I'll start with Peter and uh, move back to Kathleen and... Yeah, but... Yeah, it's a good question, Anna, indeed. I think you can think of the EU now as a migration system itself very much as a migration system, which as a consequence also has led to um, well, uh, a sharpening or deepening of the border on European uh, states, uh, of course. But it was not easy to get there. Huh? So this struggle to get to a European citizenship regime uh, the difficulties also associated with managing that uh, regime and the limits of the regime. I'm, I wouldn't say that it would be good for bureaucratic reasons. Uh, I think uh, the bureaucratic toll of that system has been incredibly high. And now also some countries are trying to limit this intra-EU mobility within well, the scope uh, that EU law uh, uh, provides. Uh, for health reasons, eh? so you, you can see this, this system also being, being under pressure. At the same time, it is um, a functioning labor uh, uh, migration system, which has been, um, well, has led to, to, to very large scale mobility and optimization of the um, allocation of, of labor throughout Europe. So if I have to be uh, after my critical narrative about the European impact of migration and asylum, I have to be positive about something, then yes, I think that this intra-EU mobility regime has worked, uh, worked rather, rather well. Yeah. Also, and, and uh, last point before I forget it, what is important, and there I'm not an expert on what happens in the Mercosur and what happens in, in Asia. I, I know that there are uh, developments in the, in, in the field of labor migration, international labor migration there as well. What is important is that um, this, this point of citizenship that you also already mentioned, uh, Anna, because, because this allows for international labor migration while being protected by that citizenship regime. So it, it, it uh, provides you know, more safety for the migrants themselves involved. Huh? They, they, take, they take with them uh, a lot of, of rights, not all rights. Huh? Many social rights are still national in, also in, in the EU. Huh? The, most social rights are even national, but at least it gives you um, well, more than a basic level of protection because you are uh, a citizen, for instance, uh, if you look at some of the more restrictionist, more conservative parts of Europe, we have tried to, to impose a mandatory integration regime on intra-EU migrants. Well, that was ruled by as, as not, not, not permissible, uh, not, not allowed, because they are fellow EU citizens from another country who just come from work. 
So you can, cannot force them to take language courses or do other things that otherwise they, they wouldn't, wouldn't do. So it comes with a good level of social protection. I think the citizenship element then should not be underestimated as a sort of a countermeasure against the more neoliberal aspects that usually come with, um, with international labor migration. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Peter, for this reflection. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I, I just want to emphasize two things. Of course, as you said, it's very important. People have full socioeconomic rights, even, you know, sometimes, of course, basically the idea is that uh, member states want to discourage that somebody would just move to another member state to register with the welfare regime of that country instead of their own uh, country of citizenship. But otherwise, in terms of study, work, establish yourself, your family, um, move back and forth. It's 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 very smooth. I, in in my view, it, it kind of resembles moving between states in the United States or moving between provinces in in Canada. Um, at the same time, we know that, for instance, in farm work, uh, speaking of one of the sectors of essential work, there are EU citizens who are internally mobile EU citizens who have been. Um, subject, subjected to very, uh, very severe exploitation because the fact that you have the rights doesn't mean you are really protected always on the ground because of the labor market dynamics. Yeah. At the same time, I want to emphasize, and then I, I wanted to ask your, your view, Kathleen, that what, what we know for, for the EU, it's because of the flexibility, the way migrants take their decisions, intra-EU migrants, is, is very dynamic. So we had seen, for instance, in the early 2010s, when Spain was going through the most acute phase of its economic crisis, people moved, say, Romanian intra-EU migrants moved from Spain to Italy or to France uh, that were in a better shape. Um, similarly, we have seen people taking decisions, well, a lot of highly skilled people moving out of Southern Europe and Ireland, again, in that same period, going to other countries. Um, oftentimes we've seen one person from the household moving and the family staying behind, um, waiting to decide. So it is in a way for me, a um, very smooth system that regulates itself because people are not forced to take a decision. It's now or never. I got my invitation to apply for permanent presidency. I have to go because otherwise it's gone or I have to fulfill all these requirements before I move. Uh, so so th that is my question. Do you think it can work better? Yeah, I, I, I really um, think that uh, I agree with you that the, the EU uh, system, you know, subject to the caveats you mentioned, has really worked pretty smoothly. And I think we have become more aware of that. Uh, because of the disruptions caused by Brexit, you know, what happens when this uh, system is withdrawn and it's been, you know, chaos and real hardship for a lot of people, a lot of um, British citizens who were longtime residents in Spain or France or so on, or banks are closing their accounts and, you know, just a tremendous amount of disruption. So sometimes you don't uh, sort of know what you have until, until you lose it. And I, I think that's uh, part of the European experience. But I think we're going to see a lot more uh, sort of regionalization of labor markets and not necessarily taking advantage of opportunities, but as a, a matter of necessity, being the mother of invention as, as people are locked out of some of the, the um, labor markets that they have had access to. They may, as a matter of necessity, turn to other countries in the region. Um, you know, there may be an acceleration of freedom of movement within ECOWAS, you know, in reality, rather than as a matter of, of theory. Uh, we're already certainly seeing that within Mercosur, although that's been driven as much by the Venezuelan crisis as by uh, labor markets. But um, I think uh, that what, what really remains to be seen is going to be the, the role not only of recruiters which, and intermediaries, which Brenda has addressed so well, but also of employers. You know, If they want to hire people from abroad, are they going to have to take on these responsibilities or require the, these responsibilities from the recruitment agencies they work with? You know, are they going to uh, have to take on health 
checks, making sure people are vaccinated, uh, documentation, and so on. And I think, you know, we haven't, we talk a lot about the state, but we haven't talked much about the role of private employers. Oh, thank you, Kathleen. Uh, maybe, Brenda, you want to uh, jump in on, on that? I'll, I'll just jump in with one small example from Singapore. And um, so amidst all the sort of stalled mobility and sort of, um, I also have uh, sort of colleagues who are in the university who are not able to come in and are working remotely. What, what is interesting is that uh, the one um, sort of migrant labor that's inelastic in, in, its, in its demand is domestic workers. So, I mean, uh, and in Singapore, we've seen a, a, a switch to, uh, instead of uh, having an oversupply of um, migrant women to choose from as domestic workers, a short supply. And uh, I think it was, predict it was announced in the newspapers that there's like 20 employers after one domestic worker. So uh, in that sense, it's inelastic in supply. So, and what we've seen is um, increasing uh, employers having to fork out more, more, more money and um, workers having a bit more space to make some demands like a day off and so forth. So it's changing the dynamics quite a bit. I mean, um, for the better in this particular, in this particular space. I mean, um, whether it will continue in that vein, I, I don't know because um, as I, um, so when the cost of, of, of mobility becomes higher and we, we're seeing the end of an era of cheap mobility, which is what in a sense underpins um, temporary migration, then um, it really makes sense for, for uh, nation states to think about, um, I, I think many are thinking of reducing the number of migrants, but at the same time, in perhaps investing in the lower numbers of migrants and, and increasing their productivity and human capital. So, I mean, that, that would be the hopeful answer, uh, even in this domestic worker space, uh, because the, the demand is really inelastic. So, and no Singaporean will take up the job. So someone has to do, do that. And that has to be migrants from the Philippines, Indonesia, Burma, and so forth. Yeah, so the, yeah, that's uh, continuing to, to see the glass half full. Yeah, I think we, 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 can, we can expect also positive change. And actually, I want to uh, kind of turn your, um, your, your statement into a question, Brenda, for Jean-Christophe and ending our, our panel. And I see also a question from uh, Naomi Alvoy there. So uh, Jean-Christophe, do you think, is, is it your sense that we would expect um, countries to turn to such a more to such more sustainable migration systems where investing more in kind of medium term or long term mobility um, instead of the drive towards temporariness that we have seen in the past 15 years? I don't know. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, there's several uh, elements. Uh, first of all, as Peter said, uh, countries uh, largely have the um, um, pretension or feeling that they can control migration, but migration is, is happening uh, in, in different ways beyond their control. Uh, obviously, forced migration, uh, but also family migration, for example, a higher share of family migrants are actually nationals marrying with people abroad, which is usually not subject to any sort of restriction. We have seen indeed uh, mobility areas uh, uh, increasing uh, uh, both in terms of, of the scope. Uh, you mentioned, uh, I mean, in Africa, in Latin America, in, in different parts of the world, uh, in, even in the ASEAN with this uh, uh, intention to focus first on professionals and ID skills. Um, so, um, I, I, and at the end of the day, when they can choose, they realize they cannot really choose because uh, because they have needs that they need to fill. So uh, I think this this uh, uh, 
perception that migration is uh, at the discretion of uh, or yeah, impacted by policies is uh, is uh, overestimated in most uh, in, in in most cases. Um, so uh, regarding the the, the long term short term, um, I think it's it's difficult to say. But my sense is. Um, and things things are probably evolving in Asia differently from from elsewhere. But I I don't see Europe uh, making yet the move to see migration as as a, a population growth uh, strategy. Uh, this is certainly a different spirit in Canada, uh, but even in the U.S. I would see that uh, with some difficulties, and and you can see that in Australia, for example. Uh, the idea is more to control population growth and uh, and to increase population growth. So, so I I'm not so sure um, that the um, the trend is necessarily everywhere towards more permanent uh, migration and less mobility. And if one sign of that, uh, which is a bit uh, anecdotal but interesting, uh, which is that the uh, the UN is. Uh, is currently discussing a revision of a, of a recommendation on migration statistics, uh, which dates back from uh, 1998. And um, basically, uh, they want to call mobility everything which is below six or 12 months, and migration only above six or 12 months. And including this mobility, everything from tourism to Asylum seekers. So this this uh, this perception that uh, uh, you know there would be more permanent and less short term. I don't know if this is a sign of a statistician or a sign of a, of, <laughs> of a politics, but uh, certainly I, I think that there are you know forces in different directions there. Okay, I, I think so. The, the conclusion of our panel is that migration happens, it's a force of nature, and <laughs> it doesn't really matter if our governance framework is future ready, right? Or that our, our governance framework is, um, like Peter was saying, for, 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 for the EU, is more looking backwards, look, trying to address the challenges that we've already faced and prepare for those instead of trying to. Uh, get a glimpse of the future and what are the challenges ahead and how we can prepare for them. Um, on this, I think I can I can close with a positive note in that Canada is more forward looking, even if not always necessarily um, succeeding in everything. And uh, thank you very much all for a very interesting and critical uh, discussion. And thanks to all our audience for being here with us for their questions and comments in the chat. Um, and we look forward to welcoming you perhaps next year in our next annual conference in person in Toronto and not online. Thank you. Thank all you, again. Anna. Thank you.